one of the uh, most recognizable men in the Bible that almost everyone is familiar with, even those that aren't familiar with biblical Christianity, is the biblical figure Noah. You've all heard of Noah. In fact, 10 years ago now, in 2014, Hollywood made a movie about Noah's life. Uh, and Noah was played, you may have seen the film by, by Russell Crowe. The movie you know, had some elements added to it that aren't uh, in the word of God. And therefore was not necessarily an accurate description of biblical events. But it does demonstrate humanity's fascination with what they would call a myth, what we know to be factual, and that is the life and times of, of Noah as a historical figure. But what is most impressive about Noah was not the boat or the flood or the animals entering two by two, but it was Noah's faith. And for this reason, in Hebrews chapter 11, when the writer under the inspiration of God's spirit is selecting key people throughout human history that had a lot of faith, Noah ends up in the list. He's the third figure in the pre-flood era. And what I want to do before we go to Hebrews chapter 11 is I want to go right back to Genesis chapter 6 and read the original episode so that we know more fully what the writer of Hebrews is, is referring to. In Hebrews chapter 6, we pick up on this account of Noah's life in verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. <clears throat> Noah was a righteous man blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah was the first person in the word of God, at least, who is called a righteous man. Now, his righteousness, of course, is relative to his peers. It's not really comparing him directly to God. It's not saying, well, he's on par with God. None of us will ever be on par with God in our righteousness. But relative to our peers, we can be men and women who are considered righteous in the eyes of God. And Noah is living in a generation where there's a stark contrast between his righteousness and the antics of his peers. And there, therefore, the reason why Noah is so relatable and the reason why you and I can benefit from a study of Noah's life, uh, in part, is because we live in the same kind of period in history when, comparatively speaking, relatively speaking, if you will, there are very few righteous people compared to the evildoers of our age. And so as we read on in the text from verse 11 following, I mean, it, it could just as well be describing life in 2024. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth, earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch, which is like a tarry bitumen substance that would seal the wood from uh, water uh, penetration. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. The breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Now, if you've ever had the opportunity to go down to the ark encounter in Kentucky. In fact, how many of you have been to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky? I see a lot of you have. If you haven't been there, put it on your bucket list. It's very worthwhile to go down and see a more or less life-size replica of Noah's Ark. It's really an astonishing place to be. And it gives you an opportunity, especially for younger people, to see that what is recorded for us in the Word of God is, is accurate. In fact, while there is some debate as to how long a cubit is, it can range anywhere from a roughly 16 inches up to about 21, 22 inches, essentially the length of the elbow to the tip of the fingers. So depending on how long that is, different cultures had different uh, standardized cubits. But roughly speaking, just to give you an idea about the size of the arc, if you run the calculations 
it would be a vessel with a volume, not a square footage, but a volume of approximately 1.88 million cubic feet. So that's a lot of space. You can divide up into various floors and cages and whatnot. Or roughly, if you think of a semi-truck going down the 401, roughly 450 of those. So it's a pretty big, pretty big undertaking. And we would say that this is a massive project. It also points to the technological know-how of the antediluvian patriarchs. I mean, they, they had it going on. I mean, you're talking sawing wood by, by hand and thousand, ten thousands upon ten thousands upon ten thousands of board feet of lumber would have been required to build this incredible vessel by relatively few individuals over perhaps upwards of a century. So it shows their technological advance, which is fascinating. But even beyond that, it shows Noah's faith that it wasn't, oh, I want you to have faith because next year I'm going to do such and such. It's like, no, I want you to have faith for upwards of a century. And you're not going to see my promises or warnings come true until then. But you labor on day after day, year after year, decade after decade, on and on and on before you're really seeing God come through in his promises. I mean, sometimes we struggle with waiting a year or two <laughs> for God to fulfill some promise. This, this guy had faith, and therefore he's, he's worthy of our consideration. He didn't quit. He labored on in a seemingly endless project with zero support from the community around him. So the description goes on, make a roof for the ark, finish it, to a cubit above and set the floor of the ark, the door of the ark rather, on its side, make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breadth of life under heaven. Everything that is on earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your son's wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you, with you every sort of food. Now they all would have been vegetarian animals until after the flood. So just basically a lot of bales of hay and grain stored up. It shall serve as food for you uh, and for them. So thank God the animals weren't eating each other yet because it would have been rather dangerous walking through the, uh, you know, the, the lion exhibit, I guess. But they probably were baby lions. You wouldn't bring big ones. But nevertheless, this is, this is an amazing depiction of a man who was given an instruction about something that would happen from our vantage point over a lifetime away. So we live to roughly, what, 70, maybe 80 years. Beyond that, this is what's going to happen beyond the lifespan of the average modern human. And I want you to get your tools out, and I want you to get to work, and no one's going to support you. And he's like, okay, I'll do it. And he just persevered and persevered and persevered. So it's not a surprise then that when you go to Hebrews chapter 11, um, that he is commended uh, for his faith in God. It, it ends in Genesis 6 this way. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. So what, what is the nature of faith? Well, evidently, faith is obedient trust and things unseen. There you have it. Faith is obedient trust in things unseen. Do you have that kind of faith? Is it present in your life? This is why Noah ends up as a perpetual historical example of faith for all generations to come. Now, bear in mind, bear in mind that his literal biological DNA 
is in every single one of us. He is our forefather. We all descend from one of the lines of one of his sons, or maybe two or three. Maybe maybe we descend from all three, depending on your ethnic origin. He is our forebear. If If your family tree is old enough, he would wind up in your family tree because only he made it through the flood with his sons and daughter-in-laws. But the question is, is his spiritual DNA in you? Are you a person of faith like your great, 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 great granddaddy Noah? Are you a spiritual descendant of Noah? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 tells us, by faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. If you desire the spiritual DNA of Noah, you too must respond to all of the commands of God by faith. You must. And that is going to require, oftentimes, that you endure for decades. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Don't set the saws down. Don't let the tools get rusty. Keep sawing planks. Keep building the vessel. Keep serving the Lord. Noah responded to something God had said. So it's very clear God is the initiator. Noah is the responder. God is the initiator. The text starts with by faith Noah, but this doesn't suggest that his faith just was pulled out of thin air. This is a response of faith. Notice the order. By faith Noah, being warned by God. So his faith is a response to a direct divine warning from God. And at this point, you need to put yourself in Noah's shoes. He had no evidence yet, no tangible proof that there was going to be a flood. There were no black clouds in the sky. The water wasn't starting to rise. It didn't look like there was any flood coming. But he believed the words of God. Now, there is some debate as to how long he did take to build the boat. Some say it was as short as 40 years. Some think it was up to 120 years because if you kind of time the warning of God and then the birth of his sons, like did the birth of his sons take place after or or is is the writer just jumping back and saying he already had sons? So there's some debate as to how long it took him to build the, the, the boat, and we don't need to split churches and form new denominations over your answer to that question, but let's just roughly say it was about a century. So about a century, he's, he's building this, this boat, but even if it was a half a century, it's still, still impressive. It's longer than human life, as I mentioned earlier, and yet he maintained his faith for that long. So there's several things we need to consider if we are going to have the spiritual DNA of Noah, if we want to possess that kind of faith, we need to break this down and think about how the Bible encourages us to have that kind of faith. And the first thing, which really is capturing the whole of the sermon series, is that the faithful believe before they see. If you see it, you don't really need to have faith. It just is. You don't need to have a lot of faith to acknowledge the fact that Aaron Rock is standing in front of you on a stage. That doesn't require faith. You believe it to be true, but it's just a fact. I'm right in front of you. You can see me. You can hear me speaking to you. You can look up at me. That doesn't require faith at all. But the faithful are those that believe before they see. The text says it was yet unseen. It's very important for us to understand that those words weren't just tossed in there to fill space. We we need to see those words in the text because it informs our understanding of faith. That faith is believing almost all the time in things that are not yet seen. What then is the guarantee of 
an outcome. Well, the faithfulness of God, the stature of God, the status of God as God, our reverent fear of God. We need to see these words in the text yet unseen because these words also capture, I would say, one of the greatest obstacles to faith. See, we are biological beings in part. And we have eyes that see things. We have ears that hear things. We have noses that smell things. We have senses. We have sensory perception. And if we only had four senses, well, we'd get used to that. If we had eight senses, we'd get used to that. But we have five senses. And the temptation then is to think, well, because I have five senses, anything that is real, anything that is genuine, anything that is true must be encountered, measured, proven by me, by my five senses. And if I can't prove them because I can't see them or hear them or taste them or whatever, then they mustn't be true. You can, you can kind of connect the dots for yourself. It's rather arrogant of us to think that something cannot be true because our little bodies can't perceive them to be true. But this is the fact of life. We believe things because we can prove them, but our understanding of proof really comes back to our capacity limits. Now, beyond our five senses, there's other things we also believe reasonably. For example, we may read things that happened in history. Oh, there was a guy that lived named Attila the Hun. Who's here met? Anybody here met Attila the Hun? But you believe he exists, existed. Caesar, all the Caesars, Roman history, Greek history, whatever it might be, the Reformation, you, you, World War II. Most of us, maybe none of us were alive during World War II. Maybe a few of you were born at the tail end of it. I don't know. We believe these things to be true reasonably because we've read history books. Or we may believe other things to be true, even though we can't see them necessarily because of the repeatability of a scientific experiment that implies they are true. Or we may believe abstract truths using mathematical equations. Or we may believe things to be true because we've experienced it. Maybe multiple times. We trust our intuition. Well, I experienced that. I know it's true. You may not believe it, but I know it's true because I experienced it. So we have all these ways or means or mechanisms, if you will, to determine what's true or false. But they're all predicated upon trust in me in you. What makes faith difficult is God saying, actually, I want you to trust me, not yourself. I want you to trust my character. I want you to trust my track record. I want you to trust my promises. And I'm not going to give you evidence. It's not evidence you can prove through a mathematical equation or through a scientific experiment or through your sight, your taste, your touch, your smell. This kind of belief comes from believing me. And what that does then is it reminds the human of the order of things, that he is creator, we are created. We are limited, finite. He is infinite. He is unlimited. And God will test this kind of faith in us time and time again as human beings. So we have all these means that we trust in, but when God says, fill in the blank, I'm going to bring a flood, I'm going to redeem you. I have a place in heaven for you, whatever the promise might be. It's a little harder to believe. And yet faith is belief in things not yet seen, but that doesn't mean mean they're irrational. We could say they are super rational responses. Supra, meaning over and above the world around us. Because that kind of faith That kind of rationality is connected to our belief in God. Now, how how is this kind of faith possible? Well, uh, the first thing we need to remind ourselves is that in part, true faith is a gift. It's gifted to us by God. When we are born again, when we are regenerated, when we become new creatures in Christ, we are gifted faith. It's not something we just kind of like rustle up by our own willpower gifted to us by God. And so when we have faith, we need to thank God for it. Beyond that, it is rooted in the character of God revealed to mankind through revelation. When we talk about revelation, this is important. 
Revelation is in part general. So God reveals general truths about himself by observing creation. And then Revelation is also special. God reveals himself to us through prophets, apostles of old, and through the 66 books of the word of God. And it is considered divine or special revelation. And when you read it, if you've been born again, your spirit testifies to the truthfulness of the word of God in a way that doesn't contradict your senses, but goes beyond it. Third, it is possible to grow in our faith as we consider God's past faithfulness. So track record is pretty important. We all know this. For example, I'm very much aware that the longer I know you as individuals and observe your decisions, observe your lifestyle, observe your track record, the more easy it is for me to trust you because I look at your history and I can more or less predict your present responses. Likewise, the longer you know me, the more you observe, the more you listen, the more you commune with me, fellowship with me, the more you get to know the person, Aaron, and the easier it is for you to trust me. And the same is true with God. When we observe God's repeated faithfulness throughout time, this is why we're studying an ancient event. We're saying, well, if God was faithful then, he's going to be faithful now. We, trust the, we, we study the faithfulness of God through history, and that increases our faithfulness in the here and now in God. And fourth, as with Noah, it naturally flows. Faith, that is, naturally flows from the life of a righteous person whose righteousness is from God. Now, we could argue that there are people in the world who have a certain semblance of righteousness, like they're, quote, unquote, good people, relatively speaking. They, uh, they're kind, you know, they, they're giving, they're conscientious. <clears throat> they don't kill people and steal people's possessions and gossip about people. They may not even be Christians, but there's an outward righteousness uh, in them. And the same is true in the Christian church. There's people that will come into a church and there's an outward righteousness, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about a righteousness that comes by faith in God as a gift, a righteousness where you see Christ in a person in a way that isn't normal to them or natural to them. When you see a person over a period of time acting like Jesus, it's like, I remember when they were kind of a jerk. I, I remember when they were unfaithful. I remember when they were ornery and angry, but I remember them surrendering to God and I've seen God do a dynamic work inside of them. That righteousness that comes by faith as a gift from God makes it easier to trust God because the spirit of God is looming larger and larger and larger in us. Now, as I describe this to you, <clears throat> I'm hoping that for the vast majority of you, it resonates. You just like get it. It's like, I, I know what he's talking about because been there, done that thought about this, experienced this. And frankly, if this doesn't resonate with you and you're like, I don't, I, I, I just can't wrap my mind around this. You're probably not regenerate. But if you're regenerate, you'll know the blessing of faith, the source of faith, and you'll be giving God glory for the faith that he has given to you. Now it's not, it doesn't mean that in our faith lives, okay, I'm not going to stand up here and say, never in any way, shape, or form have I ever doubted God. I got saved, and I just do, 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 follow his commands and follow his will, and I never doubt, I never step back. I'm like Mr. Righteous with a capital R. That's not true. We all have doubts and times of unfaithfulness. No, it was not perfect. But we can be relatively in comparison to lost people, righteous and marked by faith. So that doubt is it's just a footnote in our lives. And every once in a while, it rears its ugly head, but it's not a daily characteristic of us. And so we need to acknowledge that, that there's going to be times when there's some doubt or some, some lack of faith, but <clears throat> what we're going for 
is a life that is increasingly marked by faithfulness in the things of God. You remember Thomas, one of Jesus' uh, disciples? So he wasn't around when Jesus first appeared to the, to the rest of the disciples. And when he heard about it, he doubted. And ever since then, the poor guy has been labeled as like the doubting Thomas. But he's really not unlike us in many respects. And essentially, this word didn't exist at the time, but he wanted scientific proof. Like he wanted, unless I put my finger in the uh, spear mark in his side and put my finger in the nail mark in his hands, I won't believe it. In other words, give me, give me tangible, measurable, scientific evidence. <clears throat> and God had to correct him because he was making the mistake that many of us make, thinking that, well, if my little body here, which apparently is the ultimate determinant of what is true, if my little fingers can't touch it, or if I can't see it, it must not be true. God had to correct him and humble him. And because of that, he is actually the first, which is pretty cool, he's the first uh, apostle to say out loud, my Lord and my God. And now he puts into words, he, he out loud, Jesus had implied, insinuated, demonstrated his divinity for three years. But he's the first to say, essentially, Jesus is God. From doubt to the first to overtly declare in words the full divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which is an amazing thing. But he had to overcome his Foolish belief that only that which is real is that which I can touch, that which I can see. So faith is belief in things unseen. Secondly, <clears throat> the faithful will blend reverence for God, that's our outlook, with action. So faith is both a mind thing and a hand thing. It's, it's a posture toward God, but it also involves action. To stand before God in reverential fear means that we adore him. It means that we honor him. It means that we consider his opinion to be the supreme opinion, the, the supreme truth rather. But it's more than a thought life thing. It leads to action. So we have Noah here demonstrating reverence for God, which immediately spills over into action. In reverent fear, the text says, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. So he had the right posture and he got, got busy. I'm emphasizing this because I think at times there's this notion that faith is just an internal thing. Just, you know, I'm a person of faith. Yeah, but you're not serving. Yeah, but I have a great faith walk with the Lord. But you're not doing anything. In fact, your faith is the best kept secret in your family or place of employment. Oh, but me and Jesus are cool. Like, we're, we got something going on here. Yeah, but what are you doing to demonstrate your faith? Now, at the same time, you can be all faith-ish in your actions, but lack internal faith. So we have to have bo a both-and thing going on here. In reverent fear, he constructed an ark for the saving of his own household. Now, I do not know <clears throat> if Noah hoped that others would join him, <clears throat> but I suspect... He would have. He would have hoped that others would see what he had seen. I mean, would that make sense? Nobody wants to live out their faith life alone. I suspect that he was probably thinking, man, I hope some of my brothers and my cousins and my extended family, maybe if I just start building, they'll, they'll see the light and they'll bring their hammers and their saws and you know, they'll get in on this thing. I don't, we're not told that, but I'm just, I know a bit about human nature. Wouldn't that make sense? And he he would have probably hoped that others would have come his way. But nobody did, except for his immediate household. And yet he was assured by God that his household would be saved by God. And so he just kept building the barge. Again, day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. Would you say you have that kind of grit. Would you say you have that kind of endurance? Let me give you a pastoral insight. I've shared this before, maybe not for a little while. We're probably due to talk about this in our church. 
So remember Jesus, he calls all these men to be his disciples. So we got Judas, we got Peter, we got John, we got James, all these guys hanging out with Jesus. For one year, okay, everybody's still there. After one year, nobody's tapped out. Two years, everybody's still there. Nobody's tapped out. Three years, everybody's still there. Nobody's tapped out. But an interesting thing happens at the three-year mark. Two guys tap out. Judas taps out and Peter taps out. One betrays, one denies. They fail. They take a nosedive. Only one of them is restored and one of them is proven to be a fraud. Now, I can tell you this. I have seen that same paradigm play itself out in our church time and time and time and time and time again. Around the three-ish year mark, we've got lots of people coming into our church, getting saved, being baptized, out of the gates, into groups, being discipled. But I would suggest to you that one of the most dangerous and vulnerable times to be a Christian is around the three-year mark. I don't know why that is. It's just a, a, a pattern that I have seen. That around the three-year mark, almost every new Christian that I know experiences some sort of a crisis. All of a sudden, it's not so exciting being a Christian anymore. You know, the, the old ways are maybe starting to, to come back. The old temptations are presenting themselves. They, they know enough to be dangerous, but they're not necessarily wise yet. And so they start to judge other people and, you know, compa- forget about where they came from, become very judgmental towards others. And like, nobody can measure up to their lifestyle or they learn that walking by the spirit is incredibly difficult. It's easier to just be legalistic. And so a lot of young Christians start to like fixate on rules. This is how you got to live. And they become very fixated on the rules of the Christian faith, but they're not necessarily showing love and grace and kindness to their families, to their, to their neighbors. It happens time and time again. They start to, they start to doubt. All sorts of temptations come. And many, like Peter, repent, are humbled, and push through it. Others are revealed to be false believers, like Judas, and they fall away. Now, I'm saying this to those of you that are on the younger side of your faith, partly to make you uncomfortable. I want you to be uncomfortable. But not just to be uncomfortable for the sake of being uncomfortable, to be uncomfortable so that you might be humbled. And you might lean in and seek to be a spirit-filled, humble Christian that relies upon older Christians to guide you. That chooses trust over distrust in your church leaders, in your small group leaders, and those that are tasked to disciple you and to lead you. Because there is a temptation for us to give up. And generally speaking, I mean, there's lots of rules, exceptions to the rule. Generally speaking, I see, I see when people kind of push through that three-year mark, they, they tend to start grow, they grow exponentially, and many of them stay the course. So just receive that warning in love, because I don't want that to happen to you. But for all of us, we need to be careful not to allow ourselves to, to lose focus, to lose confidence in God. And one of the things that keeps us grounded and enduring and persevering and steadfast is frankly reverential awe in God. Just always being reminded that he's holy and by nature you're not. That he's in charge, that he's the boss. This keeps us grounded, it keeps us humble, and also enables us to blend our reverential awe with action. Third, the faithful, this is an expression of faith now, uh, preach against sin. Noah preached against sin through his actions. His hammer was one of his preaching tools. His saw was one of his preaching tools. The piles of lumber that he accumulated were one of his preaching tools. His actions and his words faithfully preached against sin. By this, it says he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Keep in mind, those that were left behind and died in the flood had already ignored Enoch's warnings two generations earlier, and many of them would still have been alive at the time of Noah. 
he wasn't the first guy to come on the scene as a prophetic voice and say, yeah, God's kind of done with the, uh, the polygamy and the murder and the idolatry. He's kind of done with that. He's smarting up. He wasn't the first. Enoch preached God's judgment against sin. They ignored Enoch's warnings. God is patient. They ignored Noah's warnings. God is patient. A lot of time to build. God could have just said, boom, there's the ark. I've built it for you. Why did God make Noah build the ark? Well, to test and develop his faith, no doubt, but also as an ongoing daily reminder to those that were watching, hey, there's an ark being built. You better reconsider your ways. God could wipe you out at any point in time. But of all the people on the earth, and there would have been thousands upon thousands at this point in time, presumably, only a very few, eight of them were saved. Eight of them became the remnant. The rest died a horrible death because of their faithlessness and their rebellion against God. As I mentioned last week, this process of warning, patience, and God finally dropping the hammer happens over and over again through history. And it will repeat itself at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is recorded for us in Matthew 24 and actually refers to Noah. In Matthew 24, verse 37, it says, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. There's a direct correlation. What's that all about? For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So God's issuing a warning. Maybe today you're sitting in this church, which is a house of worship, and you don't have faith. You're not on God's team. You're an enemy of God. Well, you need to know at any moment, at any time, God could take your life. And that's it. There's no second chance. I got lots of time. I'm young. I'm virile. I'm strong. I've got no health issues. Hey, young people die too. You never know. If you continue to wag your finger in rebellion against God, he will eventually strike you with the fullness of his wrath. And so I would encourage you to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to repent of your sins and to find new life in him. You see, the righteous will one day be saved fully. We already are, but we also will be one day. And the unrighteous will be judged by God. Now, this sobering truth from our perspective as Christians ensures vindication against wrongdoing. It ensures that God will be glorified, but it also should motivate our preaching to warn others of pending judgment, as I've done this morning. You need to know the truth, and that is that God will judge sin. And if we preach that message, in the sovereignty of God, he will give us fruit for our labors, and we will also receive, as Noah did, the reward of righteousness, which is pretty worthwhile. So know this, brother and sister, living by faith involves believing without seeing. Living by faith is expressed by believing in the promises and warnings of God, living in reverential fear, but also being a person of action and fully preaching the judgment of God, but also the mercy and grace of God. And if you are that kind of a man or woman, and I know that the majority of you are, And I'm thankful for that. We can be confident that God has rescued us from eternal wrath. And when Jesus Christ returns to judge the world in truth and righteousness, we will be rescued and we will be redeemed because Jesus is our ark. He is our means of escape. He has conquered the grave and death and we can find hope and healing and liberty in him. I hope that, that this is something you can say amen to, that it's part of your story. 